Welcome back troglodytes to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Today we have a historic episode on our hands. Last year, at the beginning of October, we lost a legend in the guitar community, Eddie Van Halen. When I heard that news, I wanted to document one of his signature guitars, and it's taken me this long to find the one that I truly wanted to document. Today, I'm taking you back in time to 2007 when the Fender Custom Shop launched the EVH branding with this. This is a Custom Shop master-built release from Fender, and that kind of makes it interesting because despite not having Fender branding anywhere on it, it was still part of their lineup. And this was an incredibly expensive guitar. They made 300 of these things, and it's rumored that they sold out within 15 minutes at a staggering price tag of $25,000. Once again, back in 2007. So you can adjust that for inflation to see how much it would cost yet today. So I hope you enjoy unboxing and reviewing this guitar with me today. I mean, we, we can't really say anything bad about it because it's a, a super high-end ultra custom shop type thing. A legend used it. This is the Frankenstrat and it weighs a ton in this flight case. So let's just go ahead and get into this thing. So with the $25,000 price tag comes a whole bunch of case goodies and whatnot. So starting with our flight case here, this is similar to what he would use to transport the guitar to gig to gig. Just to give you some idea of how thick this thing is, that's about six and a half inches, almost seven inches thick. It's heavy duty, it's rugged. You don't just have regular latches on this, you got the kind of butterfly style. And if that was not enough, you also have a combo lock. <laughs> this particular one's never been set. But to be honest, I'm really surprised at how cheap and flimsy the handle is compared to everything else. I mean, I feel like that would be the first point of contact to break out of this whole thing. But let's go ahead and open this iconic guitar up. Oh yeah, that, that looks right to me. <laughs> okay, so the Frankenstrat. There's a whole bunch of videos online telling you about the history of it. I'll go through some of what I know. I am not the biggest Eddie Van Halen historian out there but I knew that I wanted to document this guitar. Because let's face it, this is one of those guitars, even if you don't know guitar, you typically have at least seen it somewhere. So it's got value just outside of like the regular guitar collectors and stuff. So if you want one of these things yourself, you don't have to buy this expensive custom shop version. There's a whole bunch of different iterations out there that are still made yet today. You've got some in the $1,500 range. You got some in the $5,000 range. You got people that will build you replicas themselves for various price points. But this is the most collectible version ever made because the Fender Custom Shop guys, they had his guitar, they AB'd it. They replicated every single spec that he did on this original parts caster that he made. So as far as I'm aware, taking a deep in-depth look at this will either help you make your own replica if you don't want to pay the crazy price tags, or it'll at least help you appreciate the majesty of this instrument. But anyways, first impressions, you know, that is ridiculously low action. This has really tall frets on it, but the neck is actually really rather slender. It's got like a C-shaped neck profile. Like it's not super shredder thin. It still has a bit of a carve to it. That is a really comfortable neck in my opinion. But the neck itself is actually unfinished, or if it has a finish, it's just very, very thin. So think similar to a satin finish, and it's all been gunked up, you know, to replicate his, that's been played for ages. But what I find so crazy about this is they went as far as replicating such things as like this. There's steel wool <laughs> attracted to the top pickups. It's all melted in there. They copied his crappy soldering job. Because <laughs> if you don't know the story behind this one, this neck pickup on the original, it, it's just a dummy pickup. He couldn't figure out how to wire it up. And instead of a toggle switch down in this location, he has it right here. But it was only this pickup that was actually, you know, properly wired so he could use it. And the story behind this pickup in general is it came out of one of his old 60s ES-335s. And the reason why he had to slant it is because, you know, the string spacing was off. Now, I can 
totally see that the string facing isn't even quite right on this replica. You kind of needed to move it over just a little bit. But since I don't have the original Frankenstrat here, you know, looking at this replica is the best we can do. So if you were to get like an off the shelf EVH styled instrument, you generally wouldn't have like the reflective things on the back. It wouldn't have all the aging and details, right? So again, you can find multiple different variations on this if you want a piece of Eddie. The whole purpose of this guitar is to serve a very elite collector base to have, you know, the best of the best of what the Fender Custom Shop could create. But besides just our guitar here, let's take a look at our case candy. That is a heavy duty hinge right there. That's kind of cool. So this is an Anvil case. They have like a, a warranty card right here. And other than that, I'm not seeing a, a whole bunch of anything else in here. But inside here, I'm hoping we have some of like the uh, case candy and whatnot. You know it's extreme when they have to give you a whole nother box just to put your COA and stuff in. So it has an EVH sticker on the outside here. It opens up to reveal that. You get a nice, well looks like a signed Eddie Van Halen photo right here with the guitar. That's nice. And then back here, we have a certificate of authenticity that's also hand signed by him with its own protective sleeve over top of it. And then we get something else that he has personally signed right here saying, basically this is a limited edition guitar and no effort or expense was spared in creating this custom shop piece. And of course we get a sweet CD. I wonder if this was a, uh, it looks like it was custom made just for this. So maybe it has uh, some exclusive playing on it. I'm not sure about that. And of course, you got a whole bunch of EVH picks if you choose to use them. But sadly, this is kind of a, a collector's guitar. Most of these just get hung up in wall displays. And you know, it makes sense when you spend so much for a guitar. Sometimes it's more so for the art piece rather than the actual abilities of the instrument. So if you're trying to get the absolute best guitar for your money, I mean, probably just a regular EVH or a parts caster guitar of your own. But when it comes to collecting and valuables and investments, that's when you would start to look into something fun like this. So I guess to learn more about this thing, we should probably throw it on the workbench and take an individual look at all of its parts and specs and, you know, grab a bunch of these specs. That way, you know, people know what the specs of this thing was. When I woke up this morning, I didn't think I was going to tear apart a $30,000 guitar, but I did it for you guys. Not because I wanted to take apart a Floyd Rose, but let's go ahead and see what makes the Eddie Van Halen Frankenstrat tick. So this setup has always been kind of a mystery to me. I knew it was a dummy pickup and a pickup selector switch, but I didn't understand how it tied into the actual circuit, what it was doing, how it was connected. So let's go ahead and go over this. So this is just a single coil pickup. It's kind of like a dark maroon color right here. Now I did not add all the steel wool shavings that came from the factory like that. So that's just part of the aging spec. It must have been when he was, you know, cleaning off his frets, it just got stuck on there. So as this thing starts to age, those will rust, but I mean, it, it's technically factory rusting. <laughs> but here's what the backside of that looks like. Once again, it's a maroon color and it just sits in here secured by two screws like normal. One down here and one over here, but Fender did an impeccable job aging them. I mean, that looks like a screw that's been in here for 40 plus years. And on top of that, they have this faux dirt look. It's not actual dirt like maybe it is a little bit at the top but i think it's a paint or something similar that keeps it there so even if you try to rub it away i mean you can get some to come up i mean you can see that but it's not all going to come up i mean i guess unless you try cleaning it maybe it is just literally dirt they just threw it in there after putting a little bit of wet lacquer down or something but anyways onwards to this thing so this mounts to the body through two screws right here and right there so underneath it, it just looks like this. And all this wiring is just bogus. So the story goes is he tried to wire in a single coil neck pickup into the actual circuit, but he couldn't figure it out. And that's exactly what this looks like. The fact that they were able to replicate his crappy solder work and everything is just really cool. I wonder if they just said, hey, you got a bunch of high schoolers that want to learn to solder, come and try to do it. <laughs> so it looks like we have one white wire, maybe a black one, and then they just kind of get tied off and cut off under 
underneath it and that's all hidden under here. So all you see is this outside exposed and then it secures once again with two screws on the edge right there. But there's one more thing here that a lot of people probably don't even realize. So it appears he was trying to ground this off by putting a nail in the guitar and then solder this onto that. So that might be a small speck that not a lot of people know. And this right here is actually glued into the body. I'm assuming Eddie also did that on his original for some reason, just to keep it down so it doesn't come up while he's picking. But this does not connect into here at all. It is not part of the circuit in the slightest. But then we get over to the humbucker that is. It's mounted sideways once again because originally this would have been a pickup from a 60s ES335. So the spacing was incorrect. You can see all the wear and tear from the strings rubbing against the bobbins right there because he had the low action. But I was kind of curious what we would find on the back. Did they just age the front and leave that alone? No, Fender goes all out when they recreate this stuff. Even the back plate. They made it look all relict, and that's a cool little sight. And here's what the routing looks like within the body. So this is actually connected to the body with a screw right here. But then on this one, it didn't line up with the original screw hole for the bracket. So they actually mounted on this bottom one right there. He just kind of just made an extra hole in the leg right there, flattened it out just to make it work. And now over here, this is like a quarter pick guard because normally there'd be a pick guard over top of the whole thing if you have a stratocaster in fact this was originally i believe a boogie body i mean he's had a few different necks on it but you can actually see the old holes from the other type of pick guard that would have initially been on his like in these areas right here but when he converted this one from the white and black stripe one over into the one that's the, you know the most popular one he decided yeah i'd like to put part of a pick guard on here so there actually is a spot for a toggle switch traditionally unlike that right there except for it just gets covered over and is unused same thing with that so it looks like this pick guard was actually used at some point in time it's got the scratches and imprints that's kind of cool but you have a single tone knob on here but it's not a tone knob it's a volume knob <laughs> so eddie was playing with you so full on 10 it's actually pointing at eight and all the way off, it's actually pointing at 10. You know, the more you know, the tiny little details. But I was surprised when I lifted this up, you actually still have a cavity under here and it's all shielded off with the tin foil. And you can tell the solder joints look newer, but they actually aged the pot and everything. And it reads 72946, then it kind of gets covered over at 0620. I'm not sure the history of that pot, but it looks like they might've tried to find vintage original pieces. But then that all comes over here to our output jack, and that is also all shielded off like that. And it's just a basic output jack, and they really went to town aging and rusting that. So that's the electronics of the Frankenstrat. If you're wondering what this is, this used to be sticky tape. You, I think you would put like picks on here and you could take them off as he was playing if he lost them. But now let's get over to some more fun stuff. So the Floyd Rose, I decided to take it out because I'm sure there's a bunch of questions about these things. You can see originally it had just a regular Strat style one on here. But here is the Floyd Rose itself. There is a huge, ultra heavy brass block at the bottom of that. You can see the patent numbers right there. And there's nothing else on the other side. This is like no Floyd Rose I've ever done. This is actually the first Floyd Rose that I really like because it's not set up to be floating. It's actually decked right against the guitar. So you can get just enough down and just enough up without it, you know, going crazy. So I think that might be the key to some of the tuning stability that this particular instrument has and is known for. The arm is a little bit different as well. I was unsuccessful in removing that. I think you have to remove it from the bottom here. And it was kind of loose, so I tightened that up. I didn't know if that was loose from the factory or what. But I'm not an expert on the Floyd Rose model, so I'll just let you take a quick look at it right here. It's just a regular Floyd Rose with an added super heavy brass block. Let's get a weight on this thing. So the weight with the bar and you got some strings to account for. I mean, it's about a pound, a little over that one pound, two ounces or 510 grams. So that's really chunky for one of these things. But here's what the inside of that cavity looks like right here. So if you want to know why this area is so bare, it's because the tremolo actually you know, butts up against that and kind of shaves away the wood a bit. I'll show you that when I get it back in the guitar. But first I want to talk about this. So you got four holes right here and kind of a circular imprint. This is where the legendary 1971 quarter sleeps. So it appears he's tried to mount this to the guitar in many different ways. It's believed that this was initially meant to act as a trem block 
so he could like move it over like this and then that locks it into place it can't actually be pulled back once again kind of a tuning stability thing but i've heard stories that he decided it didn't really work that well in live situations so he just fully bolted it down to the guitar and it just became part of history so if you happen to find a 1971 quarter in your coin collection put it on reverb for 20 bucks i bet you somebody will buy it <laughs> but yes indeed this is a real quarter that they aged it's not a reprint. I think it was one of the employees had a wife that worked at the bank, so they just kind of sorted through all the quarters to find the 300 of them that they needed. It's kind of cool. And we'll just take a second to appreciate Fender's aging of the screws. I mean, these guys really went all out on these things, even on the bottom, except for those ones. These are the screws for the humbucker. Maybe it's just because they were black screws that they didn't age as well on the bottom side, but just small attention to detail things that nobody would ever see except for me who tears guitars apart because I like to see what makes them work. But yeah, so far I'm impressed with that aging job. And we'll just kind of continue along the body. I mean, they had to do the stripe job and then they had to age it. I mean, like right here you have like a little bit of a foam or something that's old and hard. And you've got areas where the finish has been rubbed through. I mean, this is a great relic job. I mean, they did a fantastic job here. I mean, even as far as like sticker residue and the dirt that attaches to that. I mean, this actually feels like a guitar that's been toured and played. It feels great to play. It's like that worn in feel. And it is an ash body if you're curious what type of body wood it's supposed to be. If you want to build your own little replica. Now I'm not saying build your own fake counterfeit try to scam people. I'm saying for the guys who don't want to drop five figures just for an electric guitar that's a replica. You can paint your own if you want. But it is an iconic guitar. So now we move from the body to the neck. This is a maple neck and I've been told that it's unfinished. So that's kind of why it looks like a baked maple or a roasted maple. It's just because of all the dirt that's kind of, you know, absorbed into the grain. But what I really like is it looks like it has like walnut dot inlays or some sort of a brown wood. It looks really cool. A little bit different than what you normally find on a Fender style guitar. But these frets are giant. I would say they're jumbo, but I'll let you decide just by looking at them here. But let's go ahead and capture the neck specs on this thing, starting with our scale length, which is the typical 25 and a half inches. Got a nut width of approximately 1.72 inches. By the 12th, it increases to 2.03. First fret neck depth, 0.82. By the 12th, 0.84. That stays very consistent. Here it is at the first fret, definitely a C shape and rounded, but then it does get a little bit wider up by the 12th, but still stays very rounded. It's a very comfortable feeling neck, but it is rather slim. So my first impressions definitely ring true. It's a thin neck, but not overly thin. But this does have a locking nut system, but you'll notice that they're all kind of just a little bit different. So that suggests that the tech kind of lost bits and pieces of this and replaced them as they go. So you have more of a rounded one right here. Then you have a very distinct one that has some other markings. And then one kind of similar to the first. With a string tree down here and then the headstock. I always love it when like there's a custom shop Epiphone guitar because it just doesn't make sense or like a custom shop Fender that doesn't say Fender on it anywhere. It just makes me laugh. So guitars like these, I think they're extra special because there is no branding on this one because it was never a, uh, a Fender product to begin with. I mean, it's kind of strange that Fender would make it, but you know, it's kind of a Stratocaster. One of the more famous parts casters. It's kind of like Slash's Derrick Les Paul. It, it saved the Gibson company and it wasn't even a Gibson. But they mimicked his cigarette burns on the headstock here. Now from far away, you know, I think they just stained it. I don't think they actually burned it. I could be wrong, but I do like when you get it in the light just right, it kind of has a reflection. So it does look like it could actually be a real burn. This is one of those areas that definitely looks better in person than in photos. And of course you got scratches and whatnot everywhere. As far as the resistance reading on the humbucker, it's really hot at 13.77k ohms. This is that humbucker that started it all with the whole wax potting where he dipped it in hot paraffin wax to kind of help reduce the squeal. In my setup, it still squeals quite a bit. It's a very microphonic pickup. I mean, you can hear all the nicks, dings, taps on everything, but that makes this incredibly aggressive. Playing this thing, you know, it really captures what Eddie does. You know, depending on your skill range in guitar. 
Now moving on to the backside, we have all these bicycle reflectors. You know, you see them on the back of a bike so cars don't hit them. He just had these all over here. You would think that'd be uncomfortable on the back of the guitar, but I honestly didn't even notice them. I think that's because mainly you wear it here on your body and in this area. So maybe that's why that part broke off because it kept knocking against his belt buckle or whatever he was wearing. But everything here, it was comfortable. So there's no worries there if you were ever curious about that. But you can tell he's been rather indecisive as to where the strap buttons should go on this. There's one here, there's one there, there's there. There was one right here. He eventually put a big eye bolt in right here. And that's the one piece of case candy that Fender ran out of time to replicate was his chain strap. And let me tell you, as a guy that had to demo this, not having something to properly secure to these, that was a pain in the butt. I ended up just uh, using a marker through my strap to kind of lock it into place. And yeah, that got us by for our demo today. But but, you know, it's, it's fun to see all the different locations where he had initially drilled some holes. So he must have had some sort of a balancing issue at some point because there's even some on the bottom right there, 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 there. But hey, you even still have some gaff tape right here. And this reflector is a little bit broken in this area. It's got some wear chips on this one. Just in case you want to get the exact ones that are on his. Looks like it says Sate Light. Something like that, maybe sail light, I'm not sure. I'm not a big biking reflector guy. But you got two orange circles, four red ones, and then this one might be slightly smaller than that one. I'd say it's slightly bigger than four inches. I guess by measuring, yeah, they are about the same. But here you can see where the finish has kind of been rubbed through down to the bare ash body. And then here's what our cavity looks like. So he has some sort of a cloth over top of the grounding wire there. And then here you can kind of see what I'm talking about, how the tremolo system actually butts up and kind of chips away the wood. Next, I'll put it back in here so you can see how it actually works. Okay, so here's what I was talking about with this trem. Normally, a Floyd Rose is more so like towards the middle. You can go up and down on it. However, this one, it's butted right up against the body. And that makes it so there's very limited movement because right here, that is in the way. So that's kind of what makes that chattering marks. So pulling the bar down actually just kind of makes the whole bridge wobble a little bit. It's not like a big dive bomb. You really have to press in order to get that to go down. So it hugs right up against the body. So when you pull it down, it's only able to go so far. But when you try to pull it up, there's only a little bit of leeway. So it's kind of like it's blocked down into just a down position. And the amount of movement that's just natural before it starts feeling, you know, too heavy on your hand is perfect for when he just like lightly hits the bar to detune it just a bit. The wee 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 part. Yeah, that's perfectly set up for that. And of course, the action is fantastic on this guitar. Super low with the tall frets. It was definitely effortless for me to play it. And I normally don't like Floyd Rose guitars. So, you know, whatever this setup is, it works for me. I give it a thumbs up. I even had a decent time keeping it in tune. Here's another cool feature about these. Personally, I had to take the neck off to verify that this was actually the real deal. It's possible to fake the box and the case candy in the case. It'd be tricky, but I wanted to make sure all the other stuff was in here as well. So you adjust the truss rod on this neck right here. You can see somebody's, you know, tried to chisel it in there without having to take the neck off. But look at this. So you actually have a little sticker right here that says Genuine Frankenstein EVH 09902. And I believe that's the signature of the builder right there. And you can just barely see this when the neck is on there because it only sits like right here. There is a little bit of a pocket gap. He does have a bit of a neck tilt right here with the Van Halen pick. So that's kind of cool. And then the back side of the neck also has a signature and a date stamp. So March. 23rd looks of 2007 and it also has the same genuine EVH Frankenstein sticker on it so that's what you're looking for on these but it is interesting to note that his actually has two additional screws right there not through the neck just in the body though and the stripe job does indeed continue on underneath the neck plate there now that the neck's back on, you can kind of see what I'm talking about. You can see the pick underneath there. But the neck plate itself, they also aged the screws underneath there. You got all kinds of scratches and a 61071 serial number on this. Moving on to the back of the neck, kind of the same thing as the front. It's all been aged. It's got a little bit of dirt. There's a bit of bird's eye going on here. The locking nut system is tightened down by these screws that go through the neck. And they even went as far as uh, showing you the different 
tuners that were once on here with the holes in the headstock, but currently it has an old pair of shawlers on it, just like his. The only spec that we have left to capture on this thing would be the weight, but we'll go ahead and uh, look around the edges real quick. And of course, around our neck pocket. So what a treat. Who was expecting the Frankenstrat today? I don't think anybody. <laughs> this particular one weighs eight pounds, 2.2 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in and get our Van Halen on. my final thoughts on the Fender Custom Shop Eddie Van Halen Frankenstrat. Fantastic guitar. I really fell in love with this thing. Now, a lot of it, it's, you know, signature guitar phenomenon. You feel like Eddie Van Halen playing this thing. I mean, all the aging makes it look like you're actually playing the real deal. 
And it's not necessarily just the look. I want to emphasize that. This truly feels like a well-worn in guitar. Maybe it's a placebo effect because you're seeing it, but it doesn't feel like overly grungy, but it still feels, you know, grungy enough that somebody has definitely played this. I don't know what they used to stain the neck, but that was like just perfect. It's got the right amount of tinge to it. It's got the look. It's got the feel of a worn in guitar. That was fantastic. Now, is it worth, you know, the thirty to $40,000 that you have to pay for these things today? That's up to you to decide. They're more of a collectible thing because they're of a limited edition nature. But I had a lot of fun playing it, but I'm sure you'd have a lot of fun playing the $1,500 version one too. It just depends, you know, how much disposable income you have. But I hope you enjoyed checking this thing out up close. I don't think there's ever been a video and probably won't be another video of somebody taking apart their Frankenstrat for you to take a look at. But I definitely have a brand new appreciation of this instrument because there was a lot more to this one that I, even I realized. So troglodytes, thank you for tuning in today. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.